Hello and welcome to our third webinar as part of the technical webinar series 2021. If you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A button at the right side of the toolbar and our presenters will cover as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and access to the recording will be available at our website. iGuard Corporation recently announced a technical and commercial partnership with Stride Technologies to support Zork protection product across North America and Latin America. Now technical application and product support will be available in all markets served by iGuard. Stride Technologies has over four decades grown to be a leader developer manufacturer and distributor of globally competitive medium voltage protection relays, surge suppression equipment, industrial air leakage relays, and smart energy and demand metering. Stride Technologies has captured the international market with its niche product and enjoy a strong position in a globally competitive world. Today's webinar is entitled Transformer Protection Using Surge Suppressors. It will be presented by Grant Kinloch and Christo Schottel. Brent is the current Managing Director of Stride Technologies and has been with the company for 16 years. Brent started his career at one of the largest electrical utilities in South Africa and subsequently occupied various leadership positions in electrical project engineering, business development, and marketing and technical support operation. He has accumulated 25 years experience in the electrical infrastructure industry. Brent is a competitive bass uh, fisherman, enjoys mountain biking, and he is the proud father of a set of twins. Please join us in welcoming Brent Kinloch. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Brent Kinloch from Strike Technologies in South Africa um, and assisted by Christo Skitto, who is the Vice President of Engineering for Strike Technologies. If we move straight into the topic of today, um, looking at surge suppressors and what their function is in assisting in the protection of transformers and motors and generators for that matter. So we'll cover a few topics, um, give you a brief definition um, of what surge suppression is about, some intro into transients, some mixed transients, the effect of those transients activity, which then sets the, the, the base for our uh, discussion today, some suppression techniques, uh, what we consider to be optimized search suppression, some user benefits, and then a brief look at some installation and application points uh, with regard to our product and the search suppression in general. So let us consider uh, cause basically of trans uh, high frequency transients or transients that are generated by a switching activity. And we look at these two being firstly an energization transient. In other words, the switching, uh, active switching of, uh, of any particular, um, or any switch gear or vacuum circuit breakers are switching on. And what we would find there, um, that we would normally have a high frequency oscillatory exchange of current. You can notice that it would come in at, uh, this transient would come in at very high frequencies. Um, typically occurs between the supply and the load capacitors, capacitances. And the energization of this load circuit capacitance is normally completed pretty much within a fraction of a millisecond. In other words, before any low, low frequency load current is established. Then the de-energization or the opening of a circuit breaker, um, you have the sudden interruption of the fundamental frequency, so 50 or 60 hertz. Uh, in the case of the US, obviously 60 hertz. In South Africa, 50 hertz. Um, the finite current or the electromagnetic energy in the winding is pretty much trapped, diverting to the load capacitance 
And this energy or this trapped energy then oscillates between the winding inductance and the load capacitance. And once again, you would notice that these transients or this particular transient um, comes in at quite a significantly or quite a significant frequency or a very high frequency. So what is the result of uh, potentially the switching activity, be it opening or closing of the breaker? Pretty well known um, with previous studies that we have a number of uh, transients that then might occur. Pre-strike transient or the prem premature ignition across the switch contact, that is just before the switch or the contacts uh, physically close, um, you could get up to 30 steep fronted surges, steep meaning that the magnitude of those surges are very quick and very high, um, gives it that very steep front. Uh, if you consider a graph, which we will have a look at in a minute, um, the rise of that particular surge is, is extremely quick, giving it the front described it as the steep wavefront being imposed on the machine winding. We refer to it as a machine winding. Um, for the topic of the discussion today, we're talking about transformers, but to clarify that the Zork product may also be used uh, on any other machine that contains a winding, or, uh, be it motors or transformers or generators for that matter. So in the pre-strike condition, you might have an additional ignition due to the intercontact of what is possibly known as protruding whiskers inside the contact gap or between the contacts of the circuit breaker or dielectric breakdown that happens when that uh, when those contacts are starting to close. Current chopping, um, essentially de-energization of the load at the moment when the finite current is flowing and then the arc is, ex is suddenly extinguished or chopped. V-strike, um, pretty much on the re-energization of the switch and the closing of the switch um, in the load circuit following the, the uh, opening of the switch. And then you have the dielectric breakdown across those contacts. More damaging is the combination of all of the above where we have a multiple uh, restriking phenomenon. What that means is that during energization, uh, the initial pre strike may, for example, be followed by a current chop, which in turn may be followed by a restrike. Alternatively, during the switch off operations, the initial current chop may be followed by a restrike and then again by another current chop, etc. etc. So there's a series of sequential current chops and restrike processes. And the probability of this is in the order of 30 to 40 percent. And we're talking about surge magnitudes, the size of the surge that could be anything from four to six per unit with rise times of between 0 0.2 and one microsecond. We will discuss in a minute what the per unit factor is and how we calculate that and what it means um, in, a, in a one or two slides to come. So all of these mixed transients, especially the multiple restriking transient, then obviously has an effect on the windings of the transformer or the motor. And what we find is that gradually over time, uh, it could be a short period of time, a month, a six months, year, 10 years, 15 years, any amount of time, depending on the operation and the frequency of switching, those transients um, that occur as a result of the switching activity gradually put the insulation of the windings of that machine and ultimately the pitting or the insulation breakdown becomes uh, significantly worse over time and eventually you have some breakdown of some description happening uh, on that piece of equipment and typically by way of example uh, you might have some cases, catastrophic failures of the transformer um, where the transients are impinging upon the first set of windings or the first layer of windings and ultimately leading to uh, a costly exercise by way of replacement, et cetera, et cetera. So the 
uh, effects of that transient can then be quite damaging to the equipment. The cost of this or the resultant is clearly is going to cost quite a bit of money. So we have the cost of removing the failed equipment, reinstallation, transportation, direct repair costs, production downtime. All of this is becomes an inconvenient, costly exercise, um, which is something that we want to try and avoid. So what are the solutions um, ultimately is various suppression techniques. Um, <clears throat> the basic or the ba basic suppression techniques are shown here by way of surge arrestor, surge capacitor, an RC suppressor or resistor co uh, capacitor combination. And then what we would like to refer to um, the technique being the optimized surge, surge suppressor, which consists of the R or the C resistor capacitor, as well as a zinc oxide block or a MOV as is more commonly known. So for us to have a look at what are the differences between some of these surge suppression techniques, um, we would ultimately understand, we ultimately understand that by applying a surge arrestor on its own to try and take care of high frequency transients, um, could be considered to be minimum protection, not getting full value for uh, the piece of equipment installed. So you're going to have some negatives and some positives for each one of these techniques, for the surge arrestor uh, or the MOV, typically would be installed um, and that would be equivalent to a, a lightning arrestor type uh, MOV or, uh, or similar. You'll have slight limiting of the surge magnitudes. You don't have any effect on the DVDT or in other words, the surge rise times. Uh, surge arrestor will not look after that. It does not limit voltage doubling. Um, that would be explained in one or two slides to come as to what voltage doubling is. Um, conventional surge arrestors don't really provide adequate protection uh, as the clamping voltage is pretty much higher than the motor impulse insulation with stand levels. So, and then opposite to that, lower clamping uh, with a surge arrestor might inevitably cause thermal runaway due to leakage currents at fundamental frequency conditions. So really it's pretty much very unlikely that the power surge arrestor or a surge arrestor provides adequate insulation co coordination um, at any of the impulse magnitudes or rise times. So the size of the magnitude or the, the speed at which it rises, um, surge arrestor cannot provide adequate insulation coordination for that. Also, just to, just to mention that uh, the power surge arrestors provide uh, protection with respect to earth, um, whereas the steep wavefront surges are pretty much step changes in voltage without reference to earth. When we look at the capacitors, um, it does reduce the escalation of uh, pre-strike voltage. It has an impact on the reduction on the number of pre-strikes. Uh, an undamped capacitor, in other words, a capacitor on its own without the presence of a resistor, enhances high frequency uh, cap uh, capacitive coupling and enhances the possibility of current chopping at, at the same time. Um, in the case of stall tripping, the maximum restrike voltage that follows the multiple restriking uh, with voltage escalation is then not reduced at all. Uh, also, capacitors that are installed on their own pretty much uh, or specifically at, at, in a panel might also be subject to high transient inrush currents, uh, obviously then having a, uh, an effect on that capacitor. RC suppressors, the resistor capacitor unit, which is probably one of the more uh, common applications around the world as opposed to the optimized uh, surge suppression unit. Um, what it does give you is, is a matched 
surge impedance of the load cables. Again, I'll explain that concept in um, one or two slides to come, but it doesn't match the, the surge impedance of the load cables, which is an important aspect of how the optimized surge suppressor operates. Um, but also, it does not limit the DVDT or the surge rise times. Um, somewhat cancels the voltage doubling effect. And one of the drawbacks is that you'll get the most out of your RC suppressor when it is installed at the terminals um, of the equipment being protected. Um, RC suppressors do not provide uh, or don't really provide an absolute limit uh, to the steep fronted surges. So the, the, again, the steep front means the very quick rise time uh, and the very high magnitude surges that are generated. So therefore, they may not adequately protect from a late restrike or a de-energization uh, process. Let me move on to the optimized surge suppression units. Um, these units can be stalled, installed at the load end um, or at the panel. In other words, at the close to the switch gear or at the load end or the at the transformer itself. Um, it is a device that is frequency and voltage dependent, um, which understanding the high frequency transient, it would be activated by that high frequency of the transient, but would not be in effect under fundamental frequency and voltage conditions. It is discharge free at full system voltage, and then ultimately uh, eliminates sequential reignitioning that very bad concept that we spoke about in the beginning with the multiple pre and restrike uh, concepts. So uh, pretty much during high frequency surge conditions, um, the equivalent resistance in series with the surge capacitor is reduced only on the phases in question or on a on the one on a particular phase in question. So uh, even if it's installed in the panel, um, we have pretty much does not enhance the high frequency coupling between phases. And as a result, does not, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see or, or recognize any virtual current chopping during stored chopping. So understanding the fundamentals of each one of these uh, suppression techniques uh, ultimately, the optimized surge suppression techniques or uh, surge suppression technique that are described is considered to be the best protection out of those four that are described. So what is this optimized surge suppression device? Um, the product that we have from Strike that iGod will be representing in the North American sector is the Zork. The Zork name comes from the components that are that it is constructed with and that is a zinc oxide block or a MOV, a resistor and a capacitor and obviously the acronym then derives from those components. So what is the Zork? It is pretty much all that we've described now in, in trying to take care of these high frequency transients. So it is, it is that high frequency over voltage third suppression device and it would protect uh, not only your transformer, but as described earlier, the transformers and generators from that steep wavefront that has the very quick rise time that is very high in magnitude and is typically generated by vacuum circuit breakers um, and possibly one or two other sources on, to, on, on uh, all different types of circuit breakers. So then considering the Zork search pressure, what are considered to be the user benefits of the Zork device. Keeping in mind uh, the, the description in the beginning, talking about the mixed transients and the multiple restriking um, concept that is deemed to be the, the most or the worst case scenario for your transformer or your generator. Um, one of the things that Zork does do quite effectively is halves the magnitude of the of these steep wave fronted surges 
and in, the way that it does that, which I'll also describe in a minute, is by employing the correct size resistor in this device that matches the cable um, surge impedance um, to which it is connected. Likewise, with that resistor that is, that is uh, designed into this product, as a result then eliminates the multiple restriking and pre-striking transients and the combination thereof. And obviously then prevents um, those frequency current zeros, prevents voltage doubling, um, which are those that are most or deemed to be most harmful to the winding of any piece of equipment. It provides an absolute low limit uh, or suitably low limit to those uh, steep wavefront surges. In other words, the component inside um, the Zork, the MOV, or the zinc oxide block, has a reaction time that is quick enough um, to provide the low limit, uh, a low enough limit um, that does not then proceed to go and damage the, the windings or pitting of the insulation as described previously. Similarly, um, Zork provides comp uh, comprehensive insulation coordination uh, at all practical steep wavefront surge magnitudes. In other words, all of the um, harmful surges that could or might be generated by stall chipping, by energization or de-energization, de um, Zork would have a look at that, um, protect the equipment that has a limit on its insulation capability or the insulation capabilities of um, of that or any transformer or, or, uh, or motor for that matter, and it will take those transients away without having the harmful effect of putting or insulation degradation. The Zork then protects new motors and dry type transformers um, throughout their service life for the reasons I've described. Um, meaning that the Zork can be applied, if we have a look at the next sentence, um, can be applied to new product, new transformers, new motors, as well as retrofitted onto existing transformers on installed base uh, or motors, etc. So there is no um, limit to where the Zork can be applied on those pieces of equipment. It is easily uh, applied in any application to protect the equipment, ultimately extending the life of that equipment. Uh, obvious um, user benefit here is that it's going to save you money as a result of all those things that we saw earlier um, with regard to downtime, um, repair costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's going to eliminate um, those losses that could have, could well have been incurred uh, by those harmful transients. So in understanding um, the potential breakdown and the harmful effects of these transients, um, there are numerous aspects or, or concepts at play. And number one is obviously the effect of um, the transients that degrades the insulation, but there are also other unpredictable events such as temperature vibration, et cetera, et cetera, that could contribute to the degradation of the motor and the transformer insulation being in service. Um, as we understand, there's no, there are no fixed international standards that lay down the requirements regarding the minimum voltage motor insulation levels or transformer insulation impulse withstand levels. But what we do understand is that there is well, there are guidelines prescribed by CGRE, in, in particular the CGRE Working Group 1302, um, in conjunction with the IEEE Working Group, um, that gives us some guidance as to um, the strength, not only on rotating machines, but also on transformers, uh, which gives us some guidelines as to what we need to work with, with our product, with the design of the product, to protect uh, those motors and understand uh, the impulse strength of the insulation or the lack thereof or the low impulse strength of uh, of the windings or the insulation on transformers and motors. Having a look at this graph is, is 
just a description of um, if we look at the left hand side, the fraction of wave fronts across the first coil. In other words, how much of the first coil is imposed upon by a high frequency transient and how much damage is done to that winding as a result of the transient. What we can see there uh, on the x axis, the quicker the rise time or the higher the rise time, um, the more damage is then done to a particular set of windings on a transformer or a motor. And we do understand the rise times of these high frequency transients that are generated by switching, which fall pretty much squarely into that first segment. And then you can understand for those short rise times that a significant amount of damage then could and will be done uh, to the first coil of the transformer. So we know that um, the transients are not spread throughout the, the coils or the, the, uh, the windings of a transformer. It pretty much is in impact, or the, the most of the impact is on the first set of windings and obviously imminent failure. The description of the C gray and IEEE curves or the guidelines that are given for us to understand how to position the product is shown here where you can see that uh, it's pretty much well documented that uh, routine switch on operations can result in surges of up to approximately four per unit. Again, I will explain the, the per unit values in a minute, um, but a switch on uh, activity would then ultimately or pretty close to 4 to 4.2 per unit with rise times of up to one microsecond stall tripping operations as you can see on the graph could result on or result in surges of up to five or even as much as six per unit with very quick rise times of 0.1 to one microsecond so these surges are significantly significantly higher than the motor withstand levels given by Seagray, which you can see in the yellow band. So that um, ultimately then, um, with those sort of stall tripping or switch on activities, uh, would ultimately then um, be way higher than the insulation coordination or the insulation withstand levels of any particular machine or winding, and would then damage them and degrade them pretty quickly. With the application of uh, the Zork product, um, you, can you can see the effect that it has based on this graph where it comes in well below the withstand levels as recommended by Seagray. Understanding then that the Zork would have a look at this transient or the transients uh, and keep it well away from those levels that are deemed to be damaging to any any winding on the transformer uh, or the motor the capacitors and the make uh, the individual capacitor and or the surge arrestor you can see are well within the band which uh, or the c gray band in those with in that withstand level band uh, ultimately then showing that those individual units do not provide the same sort of protection as the so-called optimized surge suppression device. Unsuppressed, um, the, the, the column that you see um, on the left-hand side, where there is no protection whatsoever, it's clear to see that the damage will be quite significant um, at any of those switch on or stall trip points, um, causing significant damage to your equipment. Just to demonstrate a very a simple graphic to show a transient that was measured without any protection applied to it. Um, in this particular case, uh, the steep wavefront, you can understand the meaning of the steepness and the, the rise time and the magnitude of the transient at its, at its peak, which in this particular case comes in at about 40 kilovolts. Um, at a very short space of time, one division being uh, one millisecond, but you can see it's a fraction of a millisecond where the highest transient has now happened, demonstrating the steep wavefront of that transient and the multiple 
activity that or the multiple activity that you see as a result of the transfer. When we have a look at the same measurement done on the same piece of equipment, but this time with the Zork installed, uh, you can see a significant difference in the peak voltage that was measured at the beginning at about 6.2 kil kilovolts. Um, but uh, significantly sloped and reduced as well as the rise time um, obviously being sloped. Now, when we talk about the steep wavefront, you can see it's significantly sloped um, over a longer period of time. So the impact on your windings are then reduced significantly by the application of a Zork product. So let us have a look at very briefly then how the Zork functions um, and what each component does and its effect on uh, or looking after any particular high frequency transient. So we describe the Zork as being a voltage and frequency dependent cable terminating device. So the frequency dependency, um, again, at 50 or 60 hertz. So we cover all fundamental frequencies. Uh, the only uh, limiting factor there on the frequencies is what we will describe a bit later is when we start talking about heat dissipation under abnormal operating conditions. But fundamental frequencies under normal operating conditions um, would be then applicable to the Zork. So uh, in conjunction, or the components in conjunction with each other, the zinc oxide block, the resistor uh, in parallel with each other, and then those in turn in series with the capacitor element. If we simplify this a little bit and we look at the single phase, uh, or we'll take one of the phases of the single phase application, we have the capacitor, the resistor, and the zinc oxide block in the configuration as you see it there. If we have a look at the function of each one of these, the capacitor under normal mains frequency conditions, so fundamental frequency conditions in the, in the US 60 hertz, the impedance of that capacitor is then extremely high uh, under those conditions. And what it then does is effectively disconnect those resistive components from the system, minimizing any heat that could be generated across those elements and obviously reducing the stress on those elements. Um, and it acts as a, the unit then acts as a cable terminating device. Opposite of that, under high frequency transient conditions, in other words, when there's switching activity from your vacuum circuit breaker, the impedance of that capacitor then becomes extremely low with respect to the resistive elements. Then by default, inserting those components into the system um, and, active, and allowing those resistive elements then to do their, or to perform their function. The capacitive element is also pretty much optimized to minimize heat dissipation and the stressing of the resistive elements under those fundamental frequency conditions. And also at, at, at simultaneously acting as a frequency dependent switch and as a wave sloping capacitor. So the waves that we saw in the previous uh, graph had significantly sloped. We did not see that steep wavefront effect of the transient without protection. And then the function of the capacitor then is to assist in sloping that, uh, that wave under the high frequency transient conditions. The resistor, as we had mentioned earlier, and I said I would get to the function of the resistor uh, as to where we spoke about uh, matching the, the surge impedance of the cable and uh, uh, preventing voltage doubling, uh, etc. The resistor is designed pretty much to match the surge impedance of the cable um, and understanding that the surge impedance of it is pretty much independent of the length of the cable. Now, in most instances, this is true. 
um, we do obviously have cables where you have a surge impedance that uh, is not independent of its length, but it is pretty much well understood um, with many studies that have been done that the surge impedance um, of, or cable surge impedance is pretty much independent of the cable length. What we have chosen for the Zork um, product with the resistance is having a value of 30 ohms. 30 ohms, again, is designed um, to be as universal as we can possibly get it with respect to the independence of the uh, surge impedance with respect to the cable length, uh, which typically could be anything between 20 and 30 ohms. So trying to design it in such a way that it becomes a more universal application in understanding that the most uh, suitably used value of 30 ohms would cover or satisfy most conditions with regard to matching the surge, surge impedance of a, a particular length of cable. In doing so, the 30 ohms would, the 30 ohm resistor would then match that surge impedance as opposed to no protection device being in place, your high frequency transient that is generated from your switching activity uh, would then go along and meet a very high impedance on the load side of a particular winding on the transformer, obviously having an impedance that's, that is much higher would then cause that transient needing to go somewhere um, where you start having the ringing effect, voltage doubling, voltages coming back, reigniting in the, in the contact gap of the switch, etc. And this is where you have your multiple re and pre-strike conditions. In matching the surge impedance of, uh, of the cable, that 30 ohm resistor prevents that surge from bouncing back effectively in layman's terms. And therefore, getting rid of the multiple pre and restrike events, getting rid of the voltage doubling concept um, that is associated with vacuum and, and some other switch gear. With regard to the MOV, these zinc oxide arrestors have a particular knee point voltage that when activated by the high frequency transient would trigger and provides a very low resistance path uh, in series with the capacitive element. So therefore you have that suitably low absolute limit that I spoke of earlier. Um, and it is that suitably low limit is provided for that high frequency um, steep wave front transient um, and effectively provides that low resist that extremely low resistance path, takes that high frequency transient through the capacitor down to earth, solving your problem of having uh, damage done to your windings of your piece of equipment. The ZNO or the zinc oxide block uh, is a gapless nonlinear arrestor with that clamping voltage that is low enough to protect the interturn insulation uh, of those li line in coils. And as we show in our graphic, that the Zork uh, or the, the, the MOV would typically activate at a value less than two per unit. So let's get to what this, what this per unit uh, means. And typically, if you need to calculate what a per unit value is, you take your line to line voltage or your V line to line, multiply it by square root of two, divide it by square root of three, which gives you your one per unit. So in the case of a 13.8 kV application, if you want to calculate what your per unit value is, um, typically you take 13.8 and the, the, the product of square root of two divided by square root of three is very close to 0 0.818 and therefore you know that your MOV typically would come in and would start clamping at around about 11.2 kV. Um, very simply then that's how you would calculate what your per unit value is um, in your in the system where Zork has been applied. Right, so uh, 
this slide just describes exactly what I've explained as to what the functionality of a Zork. This graphic then shows you just very simply the opening and the closing of the VCB, where the transient is then uh, generated, goes to the motor terminals and bounces back, um, put the Zork in place, and it looks at that transient, takes it down um, to Earth quite safely. Having a look at those rise times that I described earlier at 0.1 or 0.2 microseconds, so it is capable of recognizing that very short rise time and reacting quickly enough to take that transient down to Earth. The amplitudes that we talk about of one to six per unit, um, when we refer back to the Seagate curve and understanding, especially on stall trips, where we spoke about the per unit value that could go up to five to six per unit, um, the Zork is then capable of protecting against that amplitude or that uh, size of transient. So we would have, um, roughly speaking, we do a very quick calculation on the per unit value, 13.8. If it goes up to the maximum store tripping per unit value, we know that the Zork will be able to handle a high frequency transient, transient with a magnitude of about 67 kV. Uh, quite safely with that significantly um, high rise time or the quick rise time. If we have a look at some of the features of the Zork, the Zork is compact um, uh, enough to be fitted at the transformer or the motor, um, as well as in any switchgear panel, uh, if need be, if there is no way of installing it at the terminals of the transformer you could then have a product that, would, that could be installed uh, safely into the panel. The Zork is a low cost item. We've had to compare it typically to bespoke type of RC filters that would be designed. Um, typically would then be a costly exercise because they are quite big, they're cumbersome, they are take time to manufacture. Um, so compared to that, Zork is quite a low cost item as well as the price performance ratio that we have a look at. In other words, um, the cost of a compact Zork or a smaller Zork compared to, to the product that could be damaged that needs to be repaired. That ratio is quite uh, quite significant and, and um, beneficial. Zork is easy to apply. In other words, uh, application in this sense means you do not have to engineer anything specific about the Zork. You need to understand the system voltage which you, in which your equipment is installed and then simply select the Zork for that particular system voltage um, and then understand where you would like to apply it as, as far as if we have a look at the next sentence to apply it at the motor or the machine or the transformer um, alternatively in the panel that really would be uh, to the main criteria and then the third one being uh, would you like a single phase or a three phase Zork? We, we, we do have um, limits on the types on the single phase or the three phase types that are available, which you will see in the, in the slide to come, but there are options for both three phase and single phase units. In South Africa, we have the Zorks that would be certified for application in hazardous environments. I would suggest that um, in the US that the Zork be certified to comply with local regulations, um, but it is uh, it does lend itself to be um, certified for use in any hazardous environment. As far as Zork installation is concerned, um, Zork relatively easy to, in to install. It comes with a, a set of brackets that can be uh, if you used to mount the Zork in area, any orientation, you can install it upright, uh, up against the wall, coming, uh, meaning that it is mounted sideways or upside down. The only consideration would be that you do not apply too much of a moment of force on the bushings since they are porcelain or ceramic. And if there is too much, or the moment of force is too great on those bushings, you would then be or uh, well, the bushings could then be uh, could crack, um, causing oil leaks, etc. Um, but further to that, there are no mechanical parts inside the Zork that would be moving around, and therefore it can be installed in installed in any orientation. 
Zork is pretty much well proven, um, has been in existence for uh, approximately 35 years, and it has been installed in various applications on motors, transformers, generators, air core reactors, um, in various conditions at various altitudes. Um, and so it has proven itself over a period of time as, an, as a, a pretty much universal um, surge suppressor other than going for a bespoke type RC solution. We then have a look at the types of the Zork. Uh, we cover voltages from 400 to 1100 volts, which is um, a unit that is uh, not, well, the capacitors of this unit are not uh, inserted into an oil, which the other Zorks have in them. Uh, it's a, uh, a sealed unit. If we have a look at the other Zorks, the compact Zork, for example, and the other Zork units, other than the low voltage units, are all sealed containers. Um, which have an oil base in them, which is typically a Jarelec or a Faradol type of oil uh, inserted under um, vacuum conditions. And that is obviously just to provide, um, other than heat sink, it does provide protection to the capacitor as it penet the oil inside these units penetrate the capacitor layers and also helps with the value of capacitance achieved. Um, in the Zork unit. The compact Zork units that you see there have been uh, developed for use in motor terminal boxes specifically, but may be used in any other applications uh, for those particular voltage types and are available in three phase configuration only at this time. We then move on to what we refer to as the standard Zork units, um, the single phase units available from 3.3 kilovolts up to and including 15 kilovolts. The three phase units, similarly from 3.3 kV up to and including 13.8 kilovolts. These are the most popular units and the most frequently used units uh, and are the ones that may be mounted. You have options to have them mounted at the switch gear um, or at the machine end um, directly onto the terminals of the machine. Further to that, we then have um, the pure RC suppressor units. We call it a Zork, but one, dif uh, one difference between this and the other ones that you have just seen is that the other units have all three components in, uh, in situ being the resistor, the capacitor, and the zinc oxide block. These units, as shown here, from 22 kV up to 40 kV are standard RC suppressor units and do not contain uh, the MOV component or the surge or the um, zinc oxide block component. Uh, these are standard RC suppressor units for the, uh, for the higher voltages and are available in single phase unit only. The 22 kV unit um, does not come in a dual container configuration, but would be available in a single container configuration with one bushing that the units from 25 kilovolts up to 40 kilovolts will come in the configuration as shown in the picture with dual containers. In addition to the standard Zork range um, from ranges from 3.3 kilovolts up to 22 kilovolts uh, is the pressure, a pressure sensor that is designed as an additional safety mechanism uh, for the product to detect if there is any pressure buildup inside the Zork, which could be as a result of any external um, electrical anomalies, such as a high uh, or evidence of high harmonic voltage distortion. And we are saying that if your harmonic distortion or voltage distortion is in excess of 8% coupled with a particular order of harmonics, you might have some heat dissipation within the Zork and being a, a, a sealed unit would obviously then be subject to some pressure buildup and swelling and or failure on the Zork. So the additional safety mechanism built in is the pressure sensor 
that is rated at 0 0.8 bar um, uh, would then ultimately understand that there is some pressure buildup and send the signal via an interposing relay to your trip coil of the breaker and cut supply due to the equipment and to the and to the zork so that no further potential damage is uh, is evident. Quick run through of some of the installations, which some of which we've already covered. Um, the Zork may be installed at the panel, at the machine end. There are compact versions available. Um, you may connect the Zork with a very uh, small surface area, flexible, correctly rated or insulation rated cable um, from the terminals of the Zork to the terminals of the equipment. More importantly is the size of the, the grounding cable or the earth cable. Um, has to be of the correct size and it also has to be connected to the grounding of the machine that it is there to protect. Failure to do that, you have run the risk of creating a potential difference um, if your earth cable is running to a separate or your grounding cable is running to a separate uh, ground other than the equipment that has been protected, you could uh, realize a potential difference across that Zork, which then could, uh, could damage the components. The Zork is best used in conjunction with a surge arrestor or a lightning arrestor. Now we have a surge arrestor or a mob of some description inside the Zork and that provides a particular function, but it is not there to protect for lightning. It cannot handle the energy from a lightning strike. The time constants are also different uh, when we compare it to a high frequency transient. Lightning time constants are much longer and therefore the energy is retained for a lot longer. You would have to use Zork in conjunction with a surge arrestor in a high lightning frequency environment um, to protect not only the Zork but other equipment simultaneously. Um, if Zork is subject, subjected to a direct lightning strike, it could, uh, it, it, not could, it would fail. The components would fail because of the energy that is then imposed upon that unit and being a sealed unit, uh, that energy would have to go somewhere and it would damage the Zork uh, product quite uh, decently. Vibration is there, uh, or the, the, the concern with vibration is obvious in, in the sense that the bushings on the product are porcelain and you would then not want to mount the Zork on or in a generator, but you can safely mount it on or next to a transformer. Um, the recommendation is to either put the Zork in an enclosure or under roof so that you do not get excessive moisture or water ingress or dust or vermin uh, that could cause any flashover from the top of the terminals or the bushings to the Zork itself. Uh, we do provide additional bird cage or insulation uh, caps that are mountable on top of the bushing that provides additional insulation um, and would give you some protection against um, water ingress or moisture or dust or vermin, etc. Um, we recommend, uh, obviously we have a, uh, a certain value that we would tighten the, the nuts on the top of the bushings so that we do not put any unnecessary stress on the porcelain and crack those and we recommend 20 newton meters for tightening the bolts and the bushings at the top. Ambient temperatures, the Zork is able to function um, and this is based on the capacitor uh, manufacturing part of it or the capacitor being the most important element, um, but can operate in ambient temperatures of anything between negative 40 degrees Celsius and positive 55 degrees Celsius. Um, to just to mention that if there is constant uh, high ambient temperatures, meaning that if your Zork is applied in a, in a application or there's an application where the Zork is subjected to temperatures above 55 degrees C constantly for a period of weeks or months, uh, what you would find is the degradation of the capacitor form and foil and shortening of the lifespan of your uh, of your product. 
Um, if you had to combine that with high harmonic activity, then you could have a potential breakdown of that capacitor um, Zork then needing to be replaced. Under normal operating conditions, um, or we would consider these temperatures to be under normal operating conditions without the effects of harmonics. Maintenance on the Zork is pretty uh, straightforward and simple. Um, inspection for broken, dirty chip bushings, damage to the casing, um, any bulging on the casing, any oil leaks uh, are the most obvious signs that the Zork would need attention or need replacing. If we understand uh, these visual inspections and, and uh, have not come across anything that is contrary to what is listed, then you could probably be sure about 95% surety that your Zork product is still uh, good to go. The integrity of the components are still fine. But we do have parameters in place and available should the Zork need testing or if there is any doubt with the Zork um, functionality taken out of service and we provide uh, assistance and parameters with regard to external testing of that Zork being uh, AC and DC tests um, that can be done on the Zork to understand the integrity of the components. But uh, by doing a visual inspection, you have 95% surety that your Zork is still um, functional. Life expectancy of the Zork under normal operating conditions um, again, normal operating, normal operating conditions definition is no excessively high uh, harmonic activity. Um, excessive ambient temperatures are typical of the type of uh, anomalies that you do not want to subject Zork to. So under normal operating conditions uh, and normal switching activity, you could expect conservatively, as we state, um, your Zork to be in service for approximately 20 years. On capacitor banks or, or um, power factor correction caps, capacitor banks, we know that those capacitors uh, have typically have a lifespan of 30 to 40 years. The Zork capacitor is modeled pretty much um, or very similar to the manufacture of the, of the capacitor banks or, or uh, compensation capacitors and is pretty much over-specified for the job that it needs to do. But we have um, applied a conservative outlook onto the lifespan of the Zork, giving you 20 years, um, which is a, a significant amount of time for Zork application. Typical application examples, um, without going through the list, um, pretty much any piece of equipment that contains a winding. Transformers being the most obvious, um, motors, generators um, would be the next most obvious, but any piece of equipment where you would find uh, the use of a product that has a particular winding that is subjected to the activities of a, of a vacuum circuit breaker. The cost benefit of the Zork, um, we, we talk about the benefit cost ratio, and I've given an example there of the 13.8 kV unit that we've calculated at 12.8, and for 33 kV Zork at 16.3. What that simply means is that if you have a benefit cost ratio greater than one, um, means that you're getting the full value and more out of that product. If you have a look at the cost of the product versus the replacement or the repair costs, et cetera, et cetera. So, your benefit cost ratio is extremely favorable um, with the Zork, especially if you have to amortize that uh, the cost of that Zork over, over the lifespan or the predicted lifespan of the Zork. The numbers are extremely favorable. Then lastly, uh, typical customers, and this is by no means absolute, there are way more uh, customers across the globe that we enjoy the benefit of selling our product to, but some of the most significant ones um, across the globe include some of the bigger players like WIG and ABB and Schneider and Siemens, etc. So we are well represented across the globe and typically 
we would have sold Zork over the last 35 years to in excess of 34 to 35 countries um, in various uh, applications and conditions. Uh, those reference lists will be available from iGuard and from ourselves. Um, and we will then help you to understand where the Zork is applied, what those applications are um, as a reference list across that globe or across our globe. So very, very briefly, that concludes the understanding of the product uh, called Zork. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, we look forward to some of the questions coming up and you are free to contact either iGuard, who is now officially our North American distributor of this product. Um, you may contact iGuard on those details as well as uh, Strike. We are available at any time for any technical assistance. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Brent. We got some questions here. Okay, so the first one, the first one would be, is the Zork suitable on primary side of Delta Delta and ground transformer, 2400 voltage primary? Christo? Uh, yes, that'll be the, the 25 to 40 kilovolt uh, RT suppressors. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second one is how is the SORG determined or calculated in general terms? How is the SORG determined? Determined or calculated, yes. Um, well, like Brent mentioned, uh, basically all you need to know is your, your system line to line voltage. And then uh, you choose the the specific zorg for your application. Okay, thank you. The next question is: Is the transition problem happened for both circuit breaker type vacuum and SF6 or vacuum only? Uh, the highest priority, pro, uh, um, probability is with the vacuum circuit breakers. Um, from my understanding, you do also get um, uh, some transients uh, with the SF6 breakers, but um, the vacuum circuit breakers are more prone to that. Excellent, thank you. The next one is, any concerns about using this device on system with leading power factor, more capacitance versus inductance? Um, the additional capacitance um, would, would uh, actually uh, assist in in uh, in your your dampening of your of your transients. Um, so if you do have these high transients uh, at at the, the multiple per unit uh, values and high rise times, if you have increased capacitance, you will typically not get the the fast rise times. Okay, thank you. The next one is, can we apply Zorg for 25 kV network? Yes, you can apply that in 25 kilovolt. That will be the, the RC suppressors uh, in the range of 25 to 40 kilovolt. Excellent. And we have one more question and then two application questions. Um, this one is, is SORC available in North America? What is the average cost or average price in US dollars? Uh, yes, SORC is available in North America through iGuard. And then as far as I remember, the cost was uh, um, between two and a half and three thousand dollars in the presentation. 
Brent, your screen is on. Sorry, I'm getting there. Oh, we can we can share uh, detail on prices later on no, if you if you are okay. A little bit back, Brent, in the presentation, you oh. had the price there. Yeah. So what we okay. What All we right. refer to here is the average ZOR cost when we're working out the benefit cost ratio. Um, so the ZOR range would, depending on the voltage type or the uh, uh, application of the ZOR, it could be anything between a thousand dollars and three and a half thousand dollars on the upper end ZORs. When we're talking, um, the three and a half thousand dollars would typically be for the larger RC suppressor units. Um, so it depends on the voltage type, depends on single phase or three phase. Uh, but certainly the pricing structure would be available from iGuard uh, for the entire range of Zorks, which I'm sure that iGuard would publish. Thank you so much. Oh, I got a new one, a new question about the certification. Are the Zork product CSA or CUL approved? Um, the answer is no, it is not UL or CSA approved. The reason for that is that there is not, uh, as we understand at this time, there is not an international standard that defines the Zork as a complete product. So the configuration that you see with the Zork product, um, we, we have not seen a definition of that for us to comply to certify the Zork either UL or CE or CSA or any other standard globally at this time. However, we are in the process of investigating um, how to develop the standard with UL so that we can get the product to comply. Uh, further to that, um, with some of our existing customers in the US um, that have previously installed the Zork would have installed it uh, as a component to switch gear or any other uh, application and certified the entire thing uh, or switch gear, for example, uh, as you are with Zork being a component of that um, and therefore certified. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple of uh, questions. The next one is, can the Zork be installed on a generator operating with one phase grounded with high neutral grounding resistor? Yes, you, you'll be able to apply it. Um, the Zork will then just uh, limit the, the maximum voltage across the terminals. Just, uh, just to add to that, um, the application of the Zork on a generator would be, or the recommendation would be to install the Zork in a separate um, unit adjacent to the generators and not expose the Zork uh, to the vibration by directly connecting it in or on the generator. So you would, you would want to connect it in a separate uh, enclosure adjacent to the generator. Excellent, thank you. So the last question would be, uh, we have experienced more than 700 breaker operation over 10 years before. Two MBA transformer installation on one phase failed. Do you consider this number of circuit breakers switching enough to break transformer insulation? Yeah, due to the nature of the of the transients, um, yeah, it's actually it's it's a bit difficult to determine the amount um, that that will cause that uh, because of the voltage doubling and and uh, those effects and the fast rise times. Um, it does. It's not. It's not um, in every switching circumstance exactly the same. So yeah, it'll, it's a bit difficult to. Say yes from 500 switches, you'll you'll definitely start getting that. Um, but that's that's why these orcs should be applied in in order to limit the fast rise times and uh, uh, clamp the voltage on the on the terminals itself. 
Thank you, Christo. Thank you so much, Brent and Christo, for your presentation today. Thanks to all attendees for your questions. Uh, we would like to invite you to visit our website, uh, www.i-guard.com. You will find there all the SORC technical documentation along with this webinar recording. Also, please visit our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn. Have a great day and stay tuned for the upcoming webinars on June. Thank you.